changes not thy compassions they fail as thou hast been thou forever will be summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning
Let's pray together. Oh, Lord God, as we have just sung, we raise a hallelujah. Because the God that we know from Scripture is a God that is alive. A God who walks with us. A God who opens up our life, even as we feel the walls closing in. And so, God, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that your spirit would move in us. That we would hear new words or hear familiar words in a new way. That you would remind us that hope is alive because Jesus is no longer in the grave. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. We are alive in our spirits this morning because of that and give you thanks. Amen. I was looking for some statements about hope, and this is what I found. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite of all of the darkness. Where there's life, there's hope. I can't remember if I saw it. Put that on or not. There we go. Hope is faith holding at its hand in the dark, and hope springs eternal. It seems weird that in a book in the Bible that is filled with dark, strange images and visions of war and tribulation, you find a message of hope. Hope can, can seem just beyond our grasp these days. All the things we can't do and a very short list of things we can can leave us feeling hopeless. Being able to visit with family, be with loved ones who are dying, or even walk with friends in that proverbial sense who are going through difficult and hard personal journeys, has been hard not to be able to do that. In such times as we are living in, hope is important. It keeps us moving forward and reminds us that better days are ahead. As Jesus' followers, we find hope as we look at um, who Jesus was, the one who says, cast your burdens on me. If you're tired of carrying burdens, cast them on me. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take the yoke I give you. Put it on your shoulders and learn from me. I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest. This morning, I wanted to remind us that hope is possible because the one who carries our burdens, the one whose yoke is light, has given us new life by walking out of the tomb on Easter, and he is the same one who sits on the throne in God's forever kingdom, a kingdom where all those who have faith in his name will someday dwell with him, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles with me, turn to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation. We're going to look at chapter 7 this morning and begin reading in verse 9. The words are on the screen as well. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, people, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and, is, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? 
I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center before the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The book of Revelation is often seen through a very bleak and dark lens, giving us a vision of pestilence and punishment and famine and death and destruction, which, by the way, is all there. But if that's the only thing we see, we would be filled with despair. But John's revelation of Jesus, if we look closely, we see that is also a hopeful glimpse of glory. It is a glimpse of glory that the churches that John cared for and ministered to needed to experience because they were going through times of intense persecution in a world dominated by evil. John's visions didn't predict dark days in some distant future. His words brought comfort and hope to first century Christians who were living in a world of pestilence and fighting and danger and tribulation. His visions reminded them that even though their world seemed out of control, God was in control. And evil would be conquered once and for all, and God would ultimately triumph in the end. Now, we certainly don't live in the same kind of time that those first century Christians did in Asia Minor. But we're living in uncertain and challenging days, unlike anything we've ever experienced before. So if John wrote these words to a persecuted and suffering and dying people to be a beacon of hope for them, wouldn't his words also be a beacon of hope for us today? In such challenging times in which we live, we need to remember that we have been made new by the resurrection of Jesus. And because of that, we can have hope. So I want to explore that word hope this morning through the lens of this passage from Revelations and use the acronym H-O-P-E this morning to do that. So first is H, a hope that calls us to honor God in the midst of tribulation and trying times. John throughout the first part of the book of Revelation is given witness to this um, incredible scene of praise and worship. And we see this great multitude of people gathered around the throne of God, dressed in white and carrying palm branches. And one of the elders asks John, so who are these people? that are dressed all in white, where do they come from? And John answers, well, I don't know. You must know. And the elder says, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. I'm always amazed in some of the churches that I have served, where people think that being a follower of Jesus means that somehow they will be shielded from troubles that might come into their life. That when, so that when they get sick, or a loved one dies, or they lose their job, or face financial challenges, their faith blows up, and they feel like God has abandoned them. No place in Scripture can you read that our faith in Jesus Christ is like a plastic bubble that surrounds us and keeps us safe from harm. 
God's protections didn't keep the Christians in John's day safe from harm. After all, the way of Jesus, at least how Jesus talks about it, is always the way of the cross. And the Bible reminds us of this. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say on some days you'll have trouble or in certain times you'll have trouble. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. It is a certainty. And, and Paul remarks as well, everyone who wants to live a godly life in, G in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, what that persecution looks like is, is will be different, but the fact is we will be persecuted if we live a godly life. And so as we look and get this peek into the throne room of God in these verses, we're reminded that in the end, our earthly suffering, whatever that looks like, and it's different for each of us, will be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We will be made new through our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder as John enters into this throne room and he looks at the multitudes, if he saw faces of those people he knew. Brothers and sisters in the faith who had given their lives in service to God. People who have been fed to the lions and killed by gladiators because of Jesus. Or people who had been forced into the mouths of lions. Their hope was not in their situation or what might happen if all of that ended, but their hope was in the Jesus Christ, the one who died for them, who was redeemed, um, who would redeem their suffering as in the throne of Jesus. Their hope in that moment was realized. We honor God in the midst of life's challenges as we remember that God is with us in Jesus Christ. And that should fill us with hope. We hear these promises in Scripture that I will never leave you or forsake you. You are mine. You belong to me. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is reason for hope. And that is why we honor God in the midst of whatever circumstances we go through. The O of hope challenges us to be obedient to the Lamb. I have a weekly Zoom call with my family on Thursday nights, and this week it was my sisters and several of my nieces with my dad on the phone call, and somehow the conversation got around to disciplining of children. And my sister shared how, and her two daughters who were on the call remember that when they got in trouble, they had a timeout on the stairs in their house, perhaps in a corner, which was not the way we were disciplined growing up. If we were in trouble and had crossed some line, according to my mom, she would spank us with a breadboard. And if she was super frustrated with four kids, none of them doing what they should be doing, and she had reached her limit, didn't happen very often, but you knew when she had reached her limit when she said, wait till your father gets home. And we knew that all hope was lost. And so we went upstairs and we put on a whole bunch of Pierce underwear because we knew our dad would spank us with his hand. And it was far worse than my mom's spreadboard. One of my sisters happened to mention, because she is the good sister, that she didn't get spanked very much growing up. And I said, well, because I got them all. <laughs> Because I was not very obedient or compliant, and so I got spanked a lot. Because I didn't always listen to what I was supposed to do. I was not obedient. And I learned very slowly, one spanking at a time, how to be obedient. John talks about this great multitude in this throne room scene, so many that no one could count. And, each, and they stand before the throne of God. 
because each of them had been obedient to the Lamb. Not just because they were threatened by spankings from their Heavenly Father, but because they loved Jesus. And they wanted to live for Jesus, and they were thankful for all that Jesus had given them through his death and resurrection, and they wanted to be obedient and walk in his way. And for whatever reason, and however that happened, the way of Jesus led them to the throne room of God. Their obedience never wavered, even when their lives were threatened. These faithful, obedient followers of Jesus had been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And they had continued to believe in this Jesus, no matter the threat against their life, no matter what happened to them. They stayed true and obedient to the name of Jesus. We find hope in the midst of trying circumstances, sickness, love of a, a death of a loved one, financial or marriage challenges, job loss, whatever it is that is really that we're up against in our life right now. We can keep, if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, if we're obedient to the ways of Jesus and walk in those ways, if we keep our eyes fixed on the faithful and ever-present shepherd in our life, the writer of Hebrews says these words to us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the same witnesses that John is seeing in his vision, let us throw everything off that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles obedience. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Hope endures when we are obedient to Jesus. The P of hope says that in hope, we find the ability to sing with praise in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits, especially when life gets difficult. We sang about that this morning, didn't we? That how we can praise even in the middle of the night, even when our hearts are sad, even when we're knocked down, we can be, give praise. And the first couple of chapters of Revelation are all about praise and worship. In Revelation 5, heavenly creatures sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And in Revelation 5, we hear the voices of countless number of angels praising God, singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And in our passage, the faithful, obedient, hope-fulfilled martyrs for the faith called out, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This diverse group from every tribe and nation and people and language, a crowd of people too great to count, lift their voices as one in praise to God and Jesus the Lamb for who they are and what they have done. In every church I have served, there has always been conversation and, yes, arguments about what music we should have in church, <laughs> whether that music should be traditional hymns or contemporary worship music. Those conversations have led to no small amount of angst in church leadership. And in one particular church in which I served, the arguments got so personal that I had to resign. What we should sing on Sunday morning or what our morning worship service should even look like can divide churches. 
But John's picture of what worship should look like in the very throne room of God speaks of something altogether different. The worship service we see in the throne room of God shows the reality of redemption and reconciliation, of joy and purpose, of of hope and peace. This multitude made up of every nation and tribe and people and language is a congregation found no place on our earth right now. Because the divisiveness of nationality and the prejudices brought on by color of skin and race will be forgotten in front of the throne of God. Because in front of that throne, there is one people, and one congregation, and one church, where separate voices are joined together in a resounding harmony of praise to God. How marvelous is that? This heavenly worship service should inspire us to live the, as though, even though we live in a terribly divided society, divided by race, race and ethnicity and gender and language, it reminds us that it is possible. It is possible to sing with one voice, to be united together by our hope in who we can become. A people gathered together. In Jesus' name, with one purpose, to love our God and to love each other in hopefulness. Let us work for that. That we can be one people, joined together, our voices raised in praise to God. No matter what we think our worship should be. And finally, E, that hope lives in expectation that there can be a future. The vision that John wrote down for people who were experiencing and going through a great tribulation, they struggled to live for Jesus in a world that was increasingly hostile to their faith. Yet to these beleaguered, scared, faith-challenged people, John writes words of expectation and hope. Expectation that even though they might not survive this great tribulation, something better was waiting for them. Then as now, we who are faithful followers of Jesus experience trials and temptations, distractions and interruptions, And we are pushed and pulled and sometimes pulverized by the events in our world and in our life. Job loss and marital problems, sickness of body and mind and spirit. Yet in the midst of all of that, we can have hope. Not because we're superhuman or deny our reality, but because we have faith in the one, as the passage for next week says, who makes all things new. This is the hopeful future that John writes about, a future where never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not be down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water. John's vision reminds us that only Jesus can bring into our lives spiritual wholeness. Only Jesus can turn our fear into strength. Only Jesus can turn doubt into faith and despair into hope. In this incredible throne room scene that John gives us, he shows us that hope is possible, 
even when we continue to receive soul-numbing bad news. We can have hope as we honor God, as we stay obedient to Jesus, when we never stop praising God and have an expectation that tomorrow will be better than today. This morning in this place, surrounded by the people of God, as we have raised our voices in praise, we know because we are faithful ones, hopefully we are obedient ones, we are the ones who can remember that whatever happens in this world, whatever happens in our life, this we know to be true. That good is stronger than evil. That love will conquer hate. And that we can be filled with hope even as the world falls apart. And this is why. Nothing, absolutely nothing at all, can ever separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. That knowledge keeps hope alive. Even when sometimes we are bloodied by the events of life, for in the end, all of us are children of the King. We have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And we, one day, will join all the voices of the multitudes before the throne of God, praising the Lamb for all of eternity. That is why we have hope. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, the one who was and is and is still to come. We have come before your throne this morning in worship. And we are reminded that we are children of the King. We have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. That the power of death has been vanquished because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We are not a people who are without hope. So we thank you, our God and King, for giving us hope. But Lord, in those times when life seems to overwhelm us, when it feels like we are coming up against a brick wall and there is just no way forward, remind us again of who you are and what you have done for us. That in you, we can have hope. And Lord, as we look around our circle of friends and family and we see those who are feeling hopeless, maybe because of the circumstances in their life or because of experiences over time that just have weighed them down, Give us encouragement to go to them and remind them of the hope found in Jesus. Help us, O oh God, that each day we would honor you with our lives and our words, that we would be obedient and walk the way of the cross each and every day, that, you would, that we would offer praise to you even when life is not going well. And may we always live with the expectation that the future is better than today, and it will be, because you, our Lord and Savior, walks with you, which walks with us, and we claim the promise of Scripture that absolutely nothing 
can separate us from your love. And we thank you for that, and we praise you for that. We are a blessed and well-loved people. Amen. Oh